Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, brethren and sistren, to the Te Wahido Bible Study. My apologies, I ended up launching a kind of a variety show called The Philosophy of Art and Science, and I neglected my duties this week in getting to the concluding chapter of First Peter chapter 5. In order to repent, of course, within the week, I'm still giving you this episode, but I'll also be taking out of the vault an episode where I introduce my friend Galkidan, and this was a part of a project that I had originally prompted her to sing the Beatitudes, and uh, which is Matthew chapter 5, as well as Matthew chapter 23, and a little bit of Galatians. And so I think a year or two later, she got inspired by this invitation, which was based on my theme, that there can be no greater hymns than the hymns of Scripture, and that a lot of spiritual songs and hymns have grown corrupt because of their distance from Scripture, and so that the singing of Scripture itself would probably be the most edifying. She goes through the scroll of Isaiah and begin singing. So I'll, I'll release that along with this episode as well as its own unique episode. As always, I call upon you, whether you're in YouTube, Apple, Google, Spotify, or Anchor, subscribe to this podcast and share it with others. That's one practical way to show your gratitude. And then, of course, if you have the financial capability, find us at patreon.com slash tawahedo and make sure to be a donator. So here we go, verses 1 to 4, and today I'm in the New King James Version. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. It's beautiful. Here, the apostle Peter says he is a fellow elder. We'll get into that. So amongst the rigorous Old Testament scholars, there are much fewer disagreements, in my opinion, than the New Testament scholars. This is why I trust, you know, people like Dr. Tim Mackey and people like Dr. Michael Heiser, who graduated from the Wisconsin-Madison University along with Dr. Richard Benton of the Ephesus School Network. They were, I think, there at the same time. And they're all Hebrew Bible experts. And for the most part, where we disagree is going to be on the establishment of the New Testament parish and some of the sacramental life that comes along with that. But as far as the Older Testament, you see less of that. So interestingly enough, one of the places where you'll see cross-denominational or inter-denominational disagreements is here on the word elders. So there's an exhortation of the elders. Who are these people? Well, the Greek, which is always of the utmost importance, here translates to what we transliterate in English as presbyters. It says sim presbyteros. So the presbyters are the people being exhorted. Who are these presbyters? Well, Peter is identifying as a presbyter, but he's also writing to people who are presbyters. For the most part, the distinction and the arguments are, are these bishops, are these priests, are these priests and bishops, or do they become you know, Protestant leaders? Or at least what becomes Protestant uh, leaders several, several, several centuries, many moons later. Well, the apostle Peter is putting pressure on these people because whatever these presbyters are, there's no way that their fellow presbyterness is at the same level of Peter. Peter is one of the original apostles. He's one of the pillars. And it is the church is really Petrine and Pauline. So besides Paul, Peter's got to be the number one, right? And he oscillates, he tergiversates, sometimes he stumbles, but he's still got that position as the first amongst equals. 
And so there's no way any of the people here that he's writing to are going to be on his level, let alone any of us in different times and places that come after them who are far removed from the original context and far removed from appointment by Jesus Christ. But we still have a chance to be faithful insofar as we are obedient to the life-giving word that is found here. In the Acts of the Apostles, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tells the apostles they will be his witnesses until the ends of the earth or the ends of the world. The word in Greek for witnesses is the transliterated word martyr. I mention this all the time because it is something that needs to be emphasized. You give witness, you give testimony by speaking of the sufferings of Christ ultimately until death. There is no greater love than laying down your life for another, says John the evangelist. So the witness is a martyr. The one who gives testimony is a martyr. The ultimate form of martyrdom is death. But before death, you have many, many levels, one of which is exhortation. And here the apostle Peter exhorts his fellow presbyters who are definitely ranked below him. And he's exhorting them to function as shepherds while still acknowledging that the chief shepherd, the shepherd of shepherds, is our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And when he comes again, he will grant a crown of glory that does not fade away for those shepherds, for those presbyters, for those elders who tend the flock, who take care of the flock, who do not seek to lord over them, who do not seek just to be carried around in great and, and, and magnificent ways of splendor and, and majesty that you may see in, in the young Pope from HBO. No, he's asking them to serve. You lead by serving. If you serve the flock, if you work tirelessly for their betterment, for their encouragement, for their rebuke, all when necessary, if you want them to grow closer to Christ, if you want them to suffer as Christ suffered so that they can too receive the crown of glory, then you are a proper shepherd. Verses 5 to 11. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Father Paul Nadim Tarazi who has recently celebrated the beginning of his 50th year of teaching, his jubilee, his ultimate jubilee year having been completed, often tells us that we cannot grow in humility. Humility is not something you grow into. You cannot expand. You cannot increase. You must decrease. A great synonym amongst the many synonyms for being humble or for humility is being lowly or lowliness. I like imagining being proud contrasted with being humble in terms of lifting yourself up on high or making yourself low. So think about the contrast between high and low, heaven and earth, light and dark. And when we keep that in our minds, we will make ourselves lowly so that God can give us grace, so that God can grant us the grace of humility or of lowliness. And we can do this primarily here, as we're taught in verses 5 to 11, by submitting to our leadership. 
submitting to our elders, submitting to our presbyters, submitting to the apostles. Right now in the good is right tradition, we are celebrating the fast of the apostles. So may God grant us to follow in their path. The devil or the slanderer here is functionally a lion. We don't need to get too excited and we don't need to, to demonize all lions because in Revelation, John's revelation, as we get to it, we'll see Jesus is also functionally a lion. So don't go around being a scaredy cat or fearful of this red goat figure with pointy ears. That is a commercial construction for the sake of corporate capitalism. Instead, resist the devil, resist the slanderer in context here by not resisting your elders, by not resisting the stranger in your midst, by not resisting your enemies. In that way, you will share in the sufferings of Christ Jesus and receive his grace for being his lowly servant. Verses 12 to the end. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you. And so does Mark, my son, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So the apostle Peter is writing to them in this specific time and this specific place, while also having a message or a word of life that is applicable to all times and to all places. That is the family heirloom or the trust or the deposit, which is the apostolic teaching. And he's teaching us and exhorting us through dictation to Silvanus. Now, he could have dictated to Silvanus and then not mentioned that part. But just like in the scroll of Jeremiah, where the king is trying to get rid of this God-given message Jeremiah has, so the king enters the story by having ripped up and burned the message and Jeremiah then being told by the Lord to put that part of the story in. In the same way, we see Silvanus, who could have easily not been in this message, is entered into the scripture. He is immortalized or made forever in memory throughout all time and all place where people are reading the scroll that the apostle Peter has read um, and has us read aloud or recite so that Silvanus and his part of the ministry could be well known. So he got a shout out here. And remember, there are no accidents in scripture. I, I don't know what to say further than that, but focus on the fact that very easily this part of the letter could be, could be missing. And yet we would still have a whole part of the message that is understandable. So ask yourself, why is Sylvanus included here? Babylon is long gone in this time period. And yet here we see Rome is being called Babylon. Why? Because it's functional. In the good is right communities, I have a lot of Rastafarian friends or former Rastafarian friends. And these people often refer to America itself as Babylon. And I like that. I've always loved that because it is a reminder to us proud Americans that when we seek empire, we have the same folly of the Tower of Babylon or the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. And so we need to see things more functionally. In what ways was Rome Babylon? In what ways was America Bob or is America Babylon? In what ways is Babylon Babylon? Is Babylon a good thing or is it a bad thing? And then we see the concluding liturgical elements that are used by the is right and really all the rites. You have a kiss of love, what is also called a holy kiss. We see that all over our mass or our liturgy. There's a controversy amongst the white folks of the Roman rite or the Latin rite who are post-Vatican II lovers and pre-Vatican II lovers about how to have this kiss of love or this holy kiss and how appropriate is it, how flamboyant we should be. And then who enters the chat? The black Catholics of the Roman rite or the Latin rite. 
And when they enter, they greet each other in such beautiful, ornate ways that it makes a mockery of the disputes that people are having. The important thing is that we greet one another with a holy kiss or a kiss of love. Not that we argue that our special way is the most apostolic way. Even within our own communion, if you find the Copts who were our overseers for centuries and the Gittes right, who are both under the Alexandrian right, we have different ways of doing the kiss of love or the holy kiss. The good is right. We typically bow in four directions, not really directed at any human being, but just signifying that in all directions, we present our greetings. Sometimes you may have someone shake each other's hand or, or hug somebody, but most of the time people are just bowing. The Copts, what they do is they take their hands, they put them together. They put their hands with someone else's hands together almost like a double-handed handshake, and then they kiss their own hands after letting go of that double-handed handshake. So me and some of the other deacons, because we've visited many Coptic parishes, sometimes during the moment of the holy kiss or the kiss of love in our good is right liturgy, we'll adopt the Coptic rite of holding each other's hands and then kissing our own hands. And we do this one because we like to have a little moment of humor during the liturgy, but also an acknowledgement that this is there is no one apostolic tradition in this respect. The teaching that is apostolic is the love of God and the love of the neighbor. And we have some other things that are directly apostolic, but we have a lot of things that we may think are apostolic, which are more lowercase t traditions. So learn the difference between a capital case T tradition and a lowercase t tradition. Just like there's a difference between a uppercase R Republican and a lowercase R Republican, a capital O Orthodox and a lowercase O Orthodox. The uppercase R Republican is a member of the Republican Party. The lowercase R Republican likes a Republican form of governance or a democratic republic. The capital O Orthodox is the one who has the right religion. The lowercase O Orthodox is someone who has conventional religion or opinions or views or thoughts or beliefs. Finally, we have the peace in Christ Jesus and an amen the perfect liturgical formulas to remind us that the peace of Christ is beyond all comprehension and is that which we should always end on. Glory to God for all things.